ate last Christmas. I don't know about you, but 2008 has just gone so fast. 2007, thank you, has just gone so fast. I just can't believe that we're here at the end of the year. My wife told me last time I was here that I was too deep. And I got too much involved in theology. I kind of like that sort of stuff a little bit. But, so she said, when you go down there today, be a little lighter. Remember there are young people, children in the congregation. So I'm going to be a little lighter today. And I told Rod when he asked me what we we're going to talk about, I said, put up that it's, um, it's Christmas again. But Rod, I've totally changed it again. <laughs> I do that sometimes. It's, it's awkward You've got no idea what it's like for a minister. When, you, when you're with a church all the time, there's no problem. You can run series, run sequences. And it's, I love doing that. That's, that's my forte. But just coming into a place from time to time, you haven't got a clue what to say. You don't know what to preach about. You open your computer and there's this whole runs of sermons. And other ones, you say, which one? And you feel the Lord's impression to take one. I never quite work out of the Lord's impression or it's my own impression. I, I find it difficult to distinguish sometimes with that one. So I pick one and then through the night, the Lord says, no, not that one, this one. So I said, well, did you give me that first one, first of all, Lord, or what's going on here? So what I'm doing today is follow your dream. As we draw nearer the end of another year, we're laying plans and dreaming for next year. So um, that's what I'm going to do today. Dreams, dreams, dreams. You have a dream? They did a survey in Australia when I was there, and they found out that the most common dream that people dream is that when you're being chased by somebody or something and you're running away but you're not getting anywhere. You know the Freddie Flintstone action, you're running flat out but not moving. That's the most commonest dream people have. The second dream that people, uh, the most common one, is that you're falling off a cliff. You ever dreamt that? You're falling off a cliff and then suddenly before you hit the bottom you wake up. I've often wondered what would happen if you never woke up and you kept asleep. The third most common dream that people have is that they're walking around naked in public. Spare us. <laughs> then the fourth most common dream is that people have that dream that they were flying. Ever dreamt you're flying? Let's see your hand if you dreamt you're flying. Okay, oh, look at them, quite a few. I, I ask that for a reason because I'll tell you why. I had a psychologist tell me in Melbourne that you should never talk about the fact that you've dreamt that you were flying. And I said, why? And I'm going to use a more polite word here because we're in children's company. He said, because it indicates you have romantic fantasies. Now, who put up their hand again? <laughs> Even the saints dream. All people dream. I remember when we were on that island that I was telling the children about in Manus. And one of the things I didn't mention, which you'll be interested in, was quite fascinating to me. I said to them, do you, how do you get on for big storms that come? And they said, oh, we don't get any storms up here because in the tropics you don't have storms. That's where they're created and generated and they move out from there. But he said, what we do have, we do have high tides about two or three times a year. And he said, the whole island, all the islands, go into two and three meters of water every year, twice, two or three times a year. I said, what do you do? Oh, he said, we just hop in our canoes and we just paddle around till the water goes down again and we go down, we clean up and we carry on life as if it never happened. And they were telling me one year there that their fathers remembered, it must have been a tsunami or some such event that happened because their fathers talk about the fact when the coconut trees went under. You know, they're sometimes 60 metres high, oh, feet, sorry, 60 feet high. And they went right under the water. And he said, that was scary. But this... Um, this, this elder at, uh, at Manus, talking about dreaming. In the churches there, the people sit like you are sitting in the villages. And up the front, they have a, a special pew that runs this way. It's right angles to the other pews. And that's for the big people. Nobody else can sit there unless you're a, a big man. I don't mean physically big, but I mean in the village you're big. And this was a big man also. And he, he was sitting there, and so he came in, he sat down, and the moment he sat down, he went, <coughs> and he stayed that way through the whole of the church service. Right from the time they sang the song, everything they did, he was, <coughs> and so I, I was at the door shaking hands, and as he came out the door, 
he said something like this. He said, Oh, the pastor, Emmy, number one through me, hum a must long. Something belong you, Emmy. You give him 60, you go, and man, me, hum a must through. What he was saying, that was a brilliant sermon you preached there, pastor. I was tempted to say, what did I talk about? I didn't, of course, because I was more polite. But he was dreaming through the whole of the sermon. People dream. And you know that tradition tells us that the high priests in the Old Testament times, the high priest on the night before the Day of Atonement, you remember the Day of Atonement was a very holy day and a very special day for Israel. The night before the, uh, the Day of Atonement, the high priest was kept awake all night so he wouldn't sleep because they're a bit afraid he might dream a bad dream. They kept him awake when he was going to minister before the Lord. It was such a serious event. Dreamatologists call dreams the where we get in touch with our innermost psyche. And that's what this psychologist was trying to convince me of in Melbourne. You want my definition of a dream? I don't give this under any authority or any right to say, but this is my definition of a dream. A dream is a random selection of a, rat, of a relaxed brain. To me, that's all it is, where the brain chews information from what we've had. We may have seen a picture or read a book. It's all mixed up in there, and it randomly selects small different patches and puts them together and makes up a totally ridiculous image sometimes. That, to me, is what a dream is. But we're not talking about those kind of dreams today. We're talking about dream as in your vision and in your goal for life as a Christian. What is your dream? What is your goal? And what is your plan for your life? As a Christian, you know, it says in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter um, 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, if I can just talk to the adults a little bit of theology here for a moment, because I find this a little interesting, and I, I, I sort of love seeing how the Bible translation is done. If, if you look at the uh, RSV, which is a very good translation, it says, where there is no prophecy, people cast off restraint. Whereas the NIV that most people tend to use today, it says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. And actually, if you look at the original, that is more in keeping with what the text is actually saying. He's saying, where there is no revelation from God, where there's no God involved, people cast off restraint. And man, can't you see that in the world today? As we get our PC, and it's not just this government, it's been successive governments down through the years, have created a PC environment where we're undermining Christian values to such an extent that people are casting off restraint. You see things like, you know, feminism and gay rights moving into schools. I'll give you example, example after that. It's, it's, it's rather frightening what is happening in our society as people are turning their back on God. And, you know, we sometimes blame the Muslims. The interesting thing is not the Muslims that are causing the problems, it's some of these PC people around that are doing it to try and pacify the Muslims. Do you hear in London what they did now? The Muslims have actually come out and said, for goodness sake, you Christians, stop trying not to do things for Muslims. Have your Christmas, have your cross, have all that stuff. Because it doesn't worry us. I was amazed to hear that. And so... We find here that I'm going to take the King James Version for this one because we tend to do this sometimes. We take the version that suits our interpretation best. <laughs> so I'm going to take the King James where it says, there, there is no vision, the people perish. And that is true, isn't it? Where there's no vision, the people perish. I remember our Uncle Gray, Susanna's uncle up there at Onara, he, he's now in his 90s. And he said to me the other day, he said, then he says, I just want to die. I've got nothing to live for. See, he's lost his vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Genesis 42 and verse 9, it says, Joseph remembered his dream. You remember Joseph? Joseph was born in a very privileged position in his family. In fact, as I look at the life of Joseph, I have to say that I find him a spoiled little brat. I mean, any, any young fellow, he was a teenager, any young fellow that could go to his brothers and tell them the dreams that he had and couldn't work out how they would react to that has to be a spoiled little brat. And then his father, who had very little responsibility also, 
gives him that beautiful coat, which said heaps to the brothers, didn't it? It said to the brothers, you are worthless. This is the boy I want. This is the boy I love. And so Joseph grew up a spoiled little brat. And as, as time went on, God has an amazing way. And we're looking at that crucifixion in the, in, in the lesson study today. And you see it happening here. Now, I don't necessarily believe that God actually makes all these things happen. But as it says, all things work together for good in the life of a Christian. All things work together for good. And we're saying bad things happen to good people. And Joseph had some bad things happen to him, didn't he? Some shocking things happened to him. And from that experience, he became a man. God's man. And I, I, I remember in, in my own experience growing up in this church, you know, I, I tended to be, you know, you may have thought, some of you older ones may have thought, oh, he was not a bad kid, but I was a spoiled little brat too. I think I mentioned to you God toughened me up by sending me to the army. I didn't like it. I hated it. But he put me there. I went in a spoiled little brat, but I came back a man. And Joseph had that same experience. Joseph was betrayed by his family, repeated attempts at seduction by Potiphar's wife, false imprisonment. He could have come out and said, I'm psychologically scarred for life. I want compensation. He didn't say that. He became God's man. And I love this quote. I, I got this quote the other day and I thought, it's really not. A God-intended dream leads to God-honored results. Don't you love that? A God-intended dream. And, and this doesn't mean, now in Joseph, it was pretty big stuff because he became the prime minister of Egypt. But it's even in the little things in life that we do. You know, and I, I just want to take this opportunity here and it's none of my business because I don't know what goes on in this church. But I want to take my, life, take my hat off to the people who do the little duties behind the scenes that nobody sees. You know, people who are up front here, they get a certain amount of reward for being up front. That happened. But it's the little people behind the scenes that nobody sees, and often nobody cares, that make the church run. I'd like to honour those people this morning. You know who you are. I can say that freely because I've got no idea. And, and I think that you do a wonderful job. And that's what I'm saying about that a God-intended dream leads to God on the results. Don't just look at the big stuff. It's the little everyday stuff that we need to look at. And I believe God wants us to have a dream and I believe God wants us as Christians to dream big. To dream big. But don't leave him out. You don't leave him out. That was the problem of the rich fool in the Bible. Remember, he built these bigger barns. There was nothing wrong with these bigger barns. That was the sensible business thing to do. To build bigger barns and store his grain. God condemned him. He says, you're a fool because he left God out. He left God out of his reckoning. So when you dream, Jesus said in James, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. And you know what I've discovered? That God never works. And I think this lesson was touching on that a little. That God never works according to our timetable. I wish he would sometimes. I would love him to work to my timetable. It would be so, so good. But I think of Moses there, you know, 40 years looking after stupid sheep. Surely five years would be enough. See, God has his timetable. And I've discovered, I, I remember, you know, I, I can tell you, in my own life, some of my struggles I've had, and we all have struggles, and I have struggles, you know, just because a person, a minister, I mean, they don't have struggles, they have just as many struggles. We have just as many problems as anybody else has. And I have struggles in my life. I remember praying for God to get victory over some of these struggles, some of these issues in my life, and there seemed to be no answer. And all of a sudden, there's a breakthrough. You think, wow, God did hear. You know, I could tell you stories about my own kids and the struggles we had in some of that sort of situation. You pray about it. There doesn't seem to be any answer. And you say, God, don't you hear what I'm praying for here? And then suddenly there's an answer and you say, yes, God does hear. I have found actually, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be more and more emphatic as I get older. God never answers straight away. I believe because we have some things to learn in life too. But it's a carry on. And God wants us to dream in his own time. 
There are non-dreamers around. There are. I have a friend in Perth. He's never dreamt in his life. I can't understand it because when I go to bed at night, I just dream. Man. I seem to be dreaming, dreaming, dreaming all night. This guy never dreams. And sometimes in life, people give up that dream for their plans too. First reason that they give is, I'm too old to dream. Now, even, uh, even retired people, because Joel too says, let, let's look at this passage. I think this is a good one. We tend to know these ones so well sometimes, but this is a good one on, on dreaming. Joel chapter um, 2 and verse 28. Joel 2 and, and verse 28, where it says here, Oh, where's 28 gone? Here it is. And afterward I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. There it is. The authority of the word. Your old men and women. Doesn't say that, but it means that. Will dream dreams. So dreaming is for old people as well. Because the problem is that as we age, we tend to see dreams in this sense we're talking about this morning as just a memory. Dreams are for the young, the enthusiastic, and the inexperienced. You know, we're old, we've been along the journey. We know what it's like. We don't want to change. We don't want to dream. But here the Bible says, your old men shall dream dreams. As one ages, it's so easy to get stuck in a cycle of mediocrity. I've got to watch this myself all the time. It's so easy to get stuck in a cycle of mediocrity as you grow older and as a Christian. And the longer we stay there, the harder it is to break out. I remember Mrs. Godina. She was 98. 98 years of age and still digging a garden every year. Her tomatoes, she'd only grow one bunch because she didn't have enough fertilizer in them to get them up beyond that. But she'd just get one, one, one truss out of the tomato plants. I remember going to see her one day. She was sitting out. It was a hot day, you know, like those Melbourne summers are. It's a very hot day. And I sat down. We saw she under a tree. She had a back. You know, I crept up beside her and sat down, put my arm around her and said, what's the matter, dear? She said, oh, she said, I feel a little bit tired. She said, I think I'm getting old. <laughs> At 98. What a woman! I remember I, I pulled up and she wouldn't, she wouldn't come near church. And she'd been brought up in Adventist. She wouldn't come near church. And I kind of tricked her a little bit. And I said to her, we want to honour you for your age. And it was Australian Day, and we want you to come along as the oldest Australian. And she, she consented to come, but when she came there, of course, I brought her up the front and sat up the front. We put a flag over her, and we really honoured her. And she was just so delighted, and she reached 100, and then she died. A wonderful old lady. And I thought, man, here's a model for my life that I want to follow when I'm 98, still out there digging a garden and saying, I think I feel a little old because I'm tired. Incredible. Sometimes people don't want to dream of giving up dreaming because they have past hurts. For some, your dreams have been so shattered that you're afraid to dream again. You know how people express hurt? People seldom express hurt as hurt. Hurt is expressed as anger. And if you analyze most anger, most anger is because people are hurting somewhere inside. And there, there are some people that carry hidden anger and they're not even aware of it. And, and if, if, you, if, you find, if you find that sometimes as a Christian you're shocked because your spouse is sometimes snapping at you and is a bit angry towards you at times, they're hurting if you analyze it, you'll find somewhere deep down they're hurting. Hurt people, can you finish it? Hurt people. Yeah. Hurt people, hurt people. And sometimes because we're hurting, we've lost our ability to dream. Past failures is another one where people don't want to dream because of their past failures. I, I, I remember at, at, at Warburton when we were there, it was so tough for those church people because they had three big institutions there. There was the factory, there was the signs, there was the hospital, there's four actually, and there was this um, big health resort. The factory closed, Central Pelfrey factory closed, a beautiful factory, beautiful buildings. The hospital closed, then the health resort closed, 
I just hear that day the school is closed. Now, those members in that church of about 500 people in that church, most of them had jobs in those institutions. And I want to tell you, there were, there were times when there was a lot of hurt, a lot of angry feelings in that community at the church because they blamed the church. What happened? And there was a lot of anger. And those people were afraid to dream again because they were near retirement age and they would establish their roots there in that community. And they were hurting deeply. And a lot of our ministry was involved in trying to nurture those people, love them. And when we left, our hearts were wrenched because we knew they were going to be left there to struggle on their own. But people don't want to dream. Life is too short to be an inmate in the prison of past hurts and failure. The two wardens in this jail are called guilt and regret, the if-onlys. Friends, I don't want to come to the end of my life as I'm getting, I've, I've, I've reached retirement age now. I have actually reached the golden age. I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, if only. Do you? I don't want to do that. I don't want to look back and live with regrets and fears. I still want to dream until the day God takes me. I want to dream. Because if you let them, they'll hold you captive, torturing you of images of what could have been or what should have been. You remember Joseph? Joseph had to break out of his safety zone before he could reach his full potential. Sometimes we have to do that, break out of our safety zone. And Psalm 27 and verse 1 says, With God on our side we are fearless. It is risky, yes, but we are fearless. You remember the story, and it's an old story that I heard as a child in this church years and years ago, and some of you folks who've been around for a while know the story well, but it, it, it's a... It's a beautiful story. Maybe the younger ones don't know it. It was this farmer in America, in the northern parts of America, in the Rockies up high. He found an eagle's egg. And he very carefully took that eagle's egg and took it home. And he put it underneath a clucky chook that he had. And as time went on, the other eggs hatched out, but this one took a little longer. And finally, one day, it broke through the shell and out came this little eaglet. And it would run around with the chickens. And as it grew a little older, it would say something like this as it ran around with the chickens. It would say, I live with the chickens. I eat what the chickens eat. I look like a chicken. And I act like a chicken, but I sure don't feel like a chicken. And so the farmer clipped his wings so it couldn't fly out of the cage. As it kept on growing and it got bigger. It noticed that it was being different. One of the things where it was different was when there was a storm blowing or the wind would come up and blow, the chickens would all huddle together and fly about this far off the ground, stir up a lot of dust and run for the shelter of the cage. But this one would just stand out and look up in the sky. And he would say to himself again, he said, I eat with the chickens, I live with the chickens, I look like a chicken, they tell me I'm a chicken, but I sure don't feel like a chicken. And as time moved on, he noticed all the time that these other chickens, as they grew bigger, were pecking amongst themselves and they would fight. And every time there was a trouble or storm, they'd run into the shelter of the, of the coop and huddle together and peck on each other. And one day he was standing on a little stump about so high in the, in the cage. And as he was standing there, suddenly the cloud grew dark and a wind started to blow and a great gust came up. And all the other chickens ran for the shelter of the cage again and hid in there and huddled together and terrified. And this one just stood there and he, he looked up into the sky and as he was looking up, suddenly he saw way, way high in the sky another eagle flying with his wings outstretched. And he looked back at the chickens. There they were huddled and picking each other. And again he said to himself, he said, man, he said, I live with the chickens I eat chicken food. I play with the chickens. I don't look much like a chicken now. So I must be a chicken, but I sure don't feel like a chicken. And just then he heard the eagle in the sky made this loud cry. He looked up. The eagle was soaring way up in the sky. And suddenly, just at that moment, he, 
he, he opened his wings. And as the gust of wind came under the wings, lifted him up in the thermal currents, and he began to fly. He flapped his wings. Up, up, up he soared into the sky. Never again to return to the chicken coop. Friends, God wants us to be eagles. He says in, in Isaiah there, he said, I want you to rise up on the wings of an eagle. He doesn't want us to be chickens flapping around in the cage. He wants us to dream big. He wants us to be eagles. He wants us to soar. Tell you what, I want to soar too. In my Christian life, in my relationship with my partner, in everything I do, I want to soar. We'll move on quickly. Is motivation the key? Here are some things that um, I have discovered. They say that all we've got to do is motivate ourselves and you know you can do better, you can diet, you can exercise or read more books or build a better relationship or develop a deeper spiritual work or have devotional time with God. But these are some of the traps of motivation. Motivation isn't going to strike you like lightning, not something others can give us to help us along the way. Waiting for motivation is a trap. Don't wait, just do it. When you act, the motivation comes. You know, I, I, I remember the, the um, South African cricket team in Australia in the year was 2002, and they'd lost the first two international tests. And they went in and they beat Australia in the third. And they're interviewing the, the captain of the South African team. They said, what, what happened? What changed your style? Your style? He said, well, he said, we're sick of all these motivational talks. We're sick of all the stuff that goes on, all this PC stuff that's gone on in our team. And he said, we went out and played good, honest, hard cricket and won. Friends, the same is true in our Christian life. Stop acting like a Christian and be one. See, that's, that's the difference. That's what I'm trying to say here. And Jerome Brunter, who was a, a universal um, psychologist, he said, you're more likely to act yourself into feeling than feel yourself into acting. How does this work in the Christian life? If you're saying, well, I'm going to have my devotional study every morning, I'm going to do such and such, and if you wait till you feel like it, you'll never do it. What he's saying is just get up and do it. And as you do it, the feeling comes. I, I love this one too. This was a, um, from a, uh, a film I saw in a, uh, a video. It said, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up knowing it must run faster than the fastest line or it will be killed. You follow that? But at the same time, every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. Don't you love that? That is just so true. And what, what this is saying is that the point is it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, start running. That's what it's saying. Start running. Have that dream that God has given to you. Now I'm going to just quickly just run for you, and uh, this is very personal, but this is my five-point dream plan that I have in my life. This is just an example of what I believe can help us as Christians as we journey on the life, especially as we are moving up the ladder. So my first dream is determine your dream. Sort out the big picture. And these are my two big, I have two of them. The first one is I'm committed to the Christian lifestyle. That's my first big dream. That's number one. I don't, I don't care about lots of things that happen. In fact, can I say this very kindly, but I am more passionate now about Christianity than I'm about religion. Don't misunderstand me what I'm saying here. Religion, the church, the Adventist church and all that is only for one reason only, is to help people to find a connection to God through Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why we're here. If we forget that, we've lost the plot. And we may as well go home. The whole reason for our existence as a church is to get people committed to Jesus. That's what it's about. And I am committed to him totally. I don't care what happens in my future. I am committed to Jesus. And I have a passion for that. And people sometimes criticize me because I have a passion and I, I get a bit carried away. Yes, I do get carried away. I have a passion for him. I want you to have a passion for him too so that you're excited about this Christian message. And it is carried on to others. So the other one is my future dream is my seven-point plan, and here it is. My seven-point plan of retirement, now that I've reached this fine old age, is this, and I've written these down, I've made them very clear, so I know where I'm going. 
I'm going to spend more time in my retirement building relationships with people. Firstly, with my wife. You know, in ministry, oh, I've been out every night of the week, every night of the week for 30 years. And now I'm enjoying spending time with her for each other. Reading, I'm going to spend more time for reading. You know, people think that ministers spend a lot of time reading. I wish. You get so many pressures come upon you and you're so tired with people's issues that you sometimes don't want to read. You pick up a book and drop off to sleep. I'm going to spend more time reading. I'm going to spend more time with my music. I, I love music. And the first thing I'm going to get is I'm going to get myself a little keyboard. Not a keyboard, a good keyboard. I used to love playing at Warburton. We had a, a lady on the keyboard there, uh, Liz Dunstan. Some of you may know her. She's at the um, signs. She was a brilliant on the keyboard. She was big, I used to love playing the piano with her because when I'd come to something I wasn't quite sure and I'd just back off a little and she would just carry it over. And nobody could tell the difference. And I could come in again and they would say, oh, that was wonderful. I didn't know the struggles. I want to get back to my music. I love music. I love gardening. It's so therapeutic. I have these beautiful lettuce and they're just coming to hearts and they were just absolutely delicious. They've gone all brown. I love gardening. That's why we're, going, we're actually going to stay up where we are because I've looked around down here and there's nowhere that has as good soil as what we have. That's one of the reasons why I stay, because of my seven-point plan, you see. See, it decides my future. These are the big issues I'm looking at. I love travel. That's why I'm starting that next year on my travelling journeys. I do, I do more travelling. And six, I've always wanted a boat. I don't want a flash boat. I just want a little boat that I can go and do a bit of fishing and I can throw the hose over it and leave it till next time I go out. I want a little boat. And my last thing I have a passion for, I'm going to write a book. And it's going to be a bloke's book on Christianity. You know, how do you, how do you relate as a Christian to experience like I was doing the other day? I've got a, a box that I have of all different kinds of screws and all assortments. You would love it, Rod. It's a magic box. It's got everything in it. A thousand compartments. And I was putting up a security light on a veranda. And the veranda had quite big spaces between it. And when I finished, I was in a hurry. I grabbed the box and lifted it up and didn't have the lid closed properly. And the lid flew open and you know what happened. There were bits and pieces, thousands of them. And not only were they on the veranda, they were down underneath the veranda as well, in the grass. It took me ages to pick it all up. Threw it all, I was so disgusted. What does the Christian say in situations like that? I'm glad you weren't there to hear me. That's what I mean, see? Practical, down to earth, genuine Christian. That's what I want to write about in my book. So those are my seven-point plans. Yours may be different, but those are mine. Have you ever noticed, um, so here they are, determine your dream, we'll just run through. Focus on your dream, be committed to your dream, be disciplined, and be passionate. You know, you can have a dream, but if you don't focus on it, Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Focus on Jesus. There's your focus. Be committed, be disciplined, and be passionate. In a wrap-up, have you ever noticed how that God's masterpieces were developed in rough places? You know, I've, 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 never, I've never ever said this, and I've, I've told him personally, but I probably shouldn't do this, but the Spirit's inspiring me to do it. And I think we should say nice things to people when they're alive, when they're around. There's one, one person in this church that has had that experience more than any of us, and that's Rod here. I admire that guy. Some of the experiences he has been through. And God develops masterpieces in rough places. I remember when we were out on the Swan River, Peter Pullman, some of you know Peter? He's got this little yacht. You can sleep on it. It's got two bunks. But it's very uncomfortable because the mast pole goes right down the center. You've got to crawl past it to get into the cabin. We were out for a couple of days on the Swan River. And we went out sailing and we found the wind was not very strong. But we were moving quite rapidly. 
down the river. We all are going well. Things are good. And if you know Perth at all, we were heading towards Fremantle. And we came down to the big Fremantle Bridge. We didn't want to go under there because then you're straight out into the sea, the open sea. So we turned around and started to come back. We came back a little way, but as we came back, the wind would drop off and the actual, we were actually moving with the tide. And the tide would slowly take us back. So we, the wind would come up, so we're doing this backwards and forwards. We weren't moving anywhere, just going backwards and forwards about the length of this church. And so we thought, we'll pull over here and we'll just wait for a while until the tide is not so strong. So we waited, it was dark, and we set out again, we shoved up. The same thing, there were people out in the middle of the river, they were fishing with lanterns. We'd go past them, then we'd stop, and then we'd drift back past them again. And then we'd get a bit of wind, we'd go up past them again, and they'd make some rude comment about us. And the wind would drop off, and the tide would take us out again. We did that about five times, and they said, for goodness sake, can't you guys make up your mind where you want to go? And we're having a bit of banter between the two of us. And finally we got back about 3 o'clock in the morning and just slept on the boat. But the next morning we got up and the wind was up and we took that yacht out. And I want to tell you, I've never had such an exhilarating ride. That yacht just leant over and just whistled in the wind and just went. <laughs> Fantastic. And I was so excited. Friends, that's what I'm trying to say here today is that Yesterday's failures and disappointments and hurts can be tomorrow's victories if we trust in him. And finally, my parting words is, finally friends, fill your mind with things that are true, pure, lovely, and focus on the positive and keep dreaming. This morning for you to help us to become eagles, Lord. Lord, we, we know sometimes it's risky but we pray you'll give us the courage and give us the strength to dream again. We especially pray for those who have had hurts in the past and failures. As we pray for your strength to be given to them today. We want to thank you again for this time of year we were reminded of the fact that Jesus came. Thank you, Jesus.